to where we're going to talk about in the sermon. This morning, in our sermon series on Romans, we're on Romans chapter 8. This is the centerpiece of Romans. It's kind of the high point. It is the culmination of the argument so far. And uh, it is important enough that there have been whole books, whole dissertations written on this chapter, even just elements of this chapter alone. Uh, We're going to do the whole thing in like 25 minutes. So stay with me. But this is some of the most dense, beautiful, and important language in the entire New Testament. Paul is dealing with this question of what did God do in Jesus And we've gotten some very important parts to the argument so far that we all need what God did in Jesus, that none of us are righteous on our own. None of us are uh, pleasing to God on our own. None of us can, can, can attain what God wants us to attain on our own. And there's so many different images we have for that. Um, I use the image of a, a, a child drowning. Um, there's also image of people, you know, if you have cancer and you can't cure it by yourself. There are all these images that the church has used to describe what we are without God. We're spiritually dead. And then God did something for us that we could not do for ourselves. And then the first week, um, so that was the first week. The second week, we started with this um, initial step of justification, where we are justified by faith in the faithfulness of Christ, that our trust of God opens up a door to allow God to come in and and declare us righteous even though we are not righteous. That was a step of justification. Then last week, we went on to the next step, which is sanctification, which is the lifelong process by which the grace of God actually makes us righteous, actually turns us into people that we were meant to become, um, that actually changes us from the inside out. And all of that is building to chapter 8, where Paul is going to look at this global, cosmic look of what God is doing overall through Christ across the ages and across creation. Um, There are parts, so most of Romans looks top down. There are parts that apply to the individual but in chapter 8 especially, Rome, uh, Paul is going to be talking about like the whole of the created order and the whole of the body of Christ and taking this very kind of global look at what God does in Jesus and through that, giving us at the same time warning and assurance for the life on this earth that awaits us. So let's start at the beginning of Romans chapter 8. We're going to go through the whole chapter today, and I'll bet you you're going to recognize a lot of these passages. This is some of the most oft-quoted sections of the entire scripture. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. I'm going to pause there. The condemnation would be God's good judgment upon that which should be judged, right? Right? So anything that is contrary to the will of God, anything that is contrary to what, like every time you've looked at the world and said, why is that the way it is? It is not good to not pronounce judgment upon things that harm, upon things that bring death. And so the condemnation is God's condemnation upon that which brings death into his world that was created for life and for glory. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. And that is the image that Paul uses for what we've been talking about these last few weeks, about those who through faith reach out to the God who is reaching out to them. The image is that we have been joined with Christ so that in some way we are with Christ in this life, and we are covered by Christ. And if we are with Christ, we are also then filled with the Spirit. So this is the next part. For the law of the Spirit, of the life of Christ Jesus, has set you free from the law of sin and death. For God has done what the law, weakened by the flesh, could not do, by sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful death to deal with sin, 
He condemned sin in the flesh so that the just requirement of the law should be fulfilled in us who walk not according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. Pause there for a second. So you remember, we've been talking about the law in the last couple of weeks. This is, this, is not, this is not just a moral law. This is specifically the law that was given to the people of God about how to live according to God's way. And Paul makes the argument, not only throughout Romans, but throughout the rest of his epistles, the law is not bad. It was just that the law was not sufficient. The law could not do what the law was intended to do, which was to make us righteous. Instead, we all just looked at the law and we're like, well, I can't do that. And so through the law, um, the law was not able to accomplish bringing life, bringing righteousness, but God through Christ did accomplish that so that, and listen to this, in, uh, to deal with sin, he condemned sin in the flesh. And what that little sub phrase is talking about is what happened in Jesus, suffering death and resurrection, is that all of God's condemnation came upon sin through Jesus so that at the other side of that, sin would have no more power. Now that's very interesting, isn't it? Because a lot of times when we think about God's condemnation coming, it's coming on a particular person. It's coming on a particular, um, coming on Jesus, for example, on the cross. But what Paul is saying here is through Jesus, God condemned sin so that the powers of sin and death would have no more power. And through the suffering, death, and resurrection, um, all of sin and death would be condemned and put to death on the cross. Okay, so verse five, for just... For those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh, but those who live according to the Spirit set their minds on the things of the Spirit. To set the mind on the thing of the flesh is death, but to set the mind on the Spirit is life and peace. For this reason, the mind that is set on the flesh is hostile to God, does not submit to God's law. Indeed, it cannot, and those who are in the flesh cannot please God. But you are not in the flesh, you are in the Spirit, since the Spirit of God dwells in you. Um, what Paul is doing here is setting up a dichotomy. So we have the world of the, the flesh that he is using here. When he uses the term flesh, it's the old world, the old creation. It's you before you reached out to Jesus. It's you trying to do everything on your own. It's the whole world trying to save ourselves through our own righteousness before reaching out to God. Once you reach out to God, the spirit dwells within you and you are able to become someone that you previously could not become. And so the dichotomy that's, setting up here, that's being set up here is flesh, which is a euphemism for the old world, the old way of living, the old creation, and spirit, which is the new creation, filled with the power of God, covered by the grace of God, won by the suffering, death, and resurrection of Christ. And so it says you are not in the flesh. You, all of you who have reached out with the spirit of trust to God, you are in the spirit since the spirit of God dwells in you. If Christ is in you, though the body is dead because of sin, the spirit is life because of righteousness. If the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through the spirit that dwells within you. And so, brothers and sisters, we are debtors, not to the flesh, to live according to the flesh. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, and that word body, that's referring to flesh, that's not saying our bodies are bad. If you put to death the deeds of the flesh, you will live, right? And so here we have this image. We have the flesh, the old creation. We have the new creation, which is the spirit. We get to the spirit by this reaching out and trust. And here, where Paul says, we put to death the ways of the flesh, the old creation, we have our first clue about what that life is going to look like because 
we have our first clue that the whole thing is going to be a life with Christ, a participation in the life with Christ, including his suffering, including his death, including his resurrection. Except for us, the putting to death will be the putting to death of everything within us that reeks of the old creation. Putting to death everything within us that reeks of sin so that we might inherit the resurrection into the new creation for which we were made. For all those who are led by the Spirit are the children of God, For you did not receive a spirit of slavery to fall back into fear. You received a spirit of adoption. When we cry, Abba, Father, it is with that very spirit bearing witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God, joint heirs with Christ, if in fact we suffer with him, so we might also be glorified with him. I'm going to pause here and talk on this for a second because we've come a whole long way from, hey, pull me out of the water because I'm drowning, right? So what, where we started this journey was we can't get out of this ourselves. And I'll tell you what, when you come to God, a lot of times it's because you got yourself into something that you can't get out of yourself, right? My marriage is failing, my job is failing, my life is failing. I can't get out of this, I need you to pull me up. But God is not interested in simply pulling us out of our problems, God is interested in remaking the whole world. And this is what that looks like from a salvation perspective. God doesn't want to solve your problems, God wants to make you a child of God and joint heir with Christ. Joint heir with Christ means that at the end of this process of grace, you will look like Jesus Christ. You will look like a fully, holy, developed, mature follower of God, the same as Jesus Christ was a holy, developed, mature follower of God. You will be a joint heir with Christ And the children of God who are given stewardship of God's good created order, that is the whole goal to which, so it's kind of a little bit of a bait and switch on God's part. God's like, sure, I'll rescue you out of your trouble and now we're going to change your whole life. But that's what it is. God is not interested in simply solving our problems. God is interested in changing us from slaves into children, from slaves to sin into children of God. And becoming children of God is nothing less than changing us from the inside out. Now, how does that happen? It happens through living, through trusting Christ, being filled with the Holy Spirit, and in so doing, we start to live like Jesus on this earth. Now, you've heard this before. You've heard that you are the hands and feet of Jesus, right? You've heard Jesus say, come follow me. You've heard that you are the body of Christ. I don't know if you've thought through the implications of that. Life in the spirit, participation with Christ, means that you start to live out Christ's life on this earth, including his teaching, including his loving, including his healing, including his suffering including his death, and including his resurrection. And all of that, because Christ's life becomes your life, means that your life takes on an eternal significance that it otherwise didn't have when you were in the flesh. Because all of a sudden, the suffering that is a part of this world anyway becomes not just suffering that we go through because we're in the flesh, but suffering that is a participation in the suffering of Christ. Now, here's where we're getting into the deepest part of this chapter. Here's where we're getting into the least fun part of this chapter. In fact, if you notice at funerals, this is typically read at funerals, they skip over this part. (laughs) There's lots of parts in the Bible where you notice that when you see that, like, cross-stitched on a pillow or painted on the wall, like they've skipped over a whole section to get to the part that you want to paint on the wall. We're going to get to the good stuff, 
But this is what comes next. This is the next part of this chapter. Remember, the promise was you would become joint heirs with Christ if, in fact, we suffer with him so that we may also be glorified with him. This is the next verse. I consider that the sufferings of this present age are not worth comparing with the glory about to be revealed. For the creation waits with eager longing for the revealing of the children of God. For the creation was subjected to futility, not of its own will, but by the will of the one who subjected it, in hope that the bondage to decay and the will to obtain the freedom of the glory of God, the glory of the children of God, we know that the whole creation has been groaning in labor pains until now. And not only the creation, but we ourselves, who have the first fruits of the Spirit, groan inwardly while we wait for our adoption, the redemption of our bodies. For in hope we were not saved. Hope that is seen is not hope who hopes for what is seen, but we hope for what we do not see. Likewise, we wait for it with patience. So that whole section where Paul is talking about suffering and groaning, the word groaning is repeated. And it is we who groan because as we wait for the redemption of our bodies, what that means is as you wait for God to deal with the rest of the stuff that is not yet dealt with, because it doesn't happen overnight, you come to God and he pulls you up and he starts to work within you, but it doesn't happen immediately. And so as you are waiting for God to do the rest of the work within you, there is this groaning, there is this waiting, but it's not just you, it is all of creation. It is the whole world in which we live. And when you look out at the, at the world, when you read the news, and when you say, why? <laughs> why did this happen? Whether it is something that is human caused, or whether it is something that seems innate within the created order, cancer, natural disasters, all of the things that cause suffering across the face of the earth is what Paul would call the groaning of creation, awaiting the new birth that is coming as all creation groans together in what he calls labor pains as something new is coming. And I wanna read this next section to you. Likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weakness, for we do not know how to pray as we ought, but that very Spirit intercedes with us with sighs too deep for words. And God, who searches the heart, knows what in the mind of the Spirit, because the Spirit knows what is in the mind of the Spirit because the Spirit intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. We know that all things work together for good for those who love God. That's probably, so your translation, translations have said that for a few years now, but if you look at the Greek, the active um, word is not all things work together, it's God works together. God works together through all things. Through the, with the people who love God, who are called according to his purpose. For those he foreknew, he also predestined. For those he, con- to be conformed to the image of his son, in order that he might be the firstborn within a large family. And those he predestined, he also called. And those he called, he also justified. And those he justified, he also glorified. Okay, I'm going to spend a couple of minutes on this whole section, because this is the heart of what we need to get our minds around if we're going to move to that glorious promise that comes to us in just a few chapters coming. Because what what Paul is laying out here is that you and I, putting our trust in God, are called into this glorious vocation of becoming children of God, of becoming people who look like Christ, of becoming people who, with Christ's vocation here on earth, but a part of that vocation is necessarily going to entail suffering. The suffering that happens to ourselves, the suffering that happens to the all creation around us, the suffering that happens to the people within our lives, and part of our vocation is not just going to be writing it off as things that happen in the world, but in fact, bringing all of that suffering into the presence of God and under the grace of Christ with the trust that God is doing something, God is working all things, even if we cannot see it. So the image that he uses is very relevant to me right now 
Because what he says is the pains that the world suffers are labor pains, right? The pains that the world suffers, and the world meaning everything from an earthquake to cancer to you, you losing your job, the pains the world suffers are labor pains to bring about that which God is bringing about. Now I have to say, I read, I, I thought very poetically about motherhood before I became a mother, right? So people have asked me, I'm pregnant in case you can't tell. In fact, I have to watch myself on YouTube every week and I'm getting bigger and bigger and I wanna go and comment and be like, oh, look, I'm pregnant. Um, I didn't just suddenly gain 40 pounds out of nowhere. That's also why I can't breathe. By the way, I went to an appointment the last week and the doctor was like, wow, the baby's really high. And I was like, I know. And she goes, it's gonna get worse. And I was like, thanks. People have been like, how are you doing? And I'm like, it sucks. Like, it sucks. Like, pregnancy is terrible. Pregnancy is horrible. Pregnancy is designed to make childbirth look appealing, right? You're like, childbirth is nothing compared to getting through this. But you know what? The pain of childbirth. Oh, here's another lie. People tell you, the pain of childbirth, you'll forget it after the baby's born. That's a lie. You don't forget it. But what happens is you have in your arms the fruit of your pain, right? And you hold in your hands a love that you thought you could never experience. And you become a new person that you never even thought you could become. And you didn't know that was happening the whole way along pregnancy, the whole way along labor. You didn't know that was happening, but what is happening is you are transformed from someone who didn't have children into someone who does have children. From someone who didn't know they could love like that to someone who all of a sudden can love more deeply than you ever thought you could love. And it is not that you forget the pain, it's that you contextualize the pain to the point that you're willing to do it again, right? And what Paul is saying here is that if you understand the pain of this life in its correct context, it's not that the pain becomes less. It's not that suffering becomes less. It's that one day you will understand what is being born. Because what is being born through those who suffer with Christ is nothing less than a new creation, a new world, a new way of being, a new heavens and a new earth and a new race of Adam who are going to take our place as the children of God, as people who bring life into this world and not death into this world as people who are glorified, and by glorified we mean being filled fully with the Holy Spirit and made into the people, the creatures we were meant to become, people who no longer wrestle with the darkness within ourselves but are so full of light. And maybe it's hard to understand until we see it finally, but Paul says the day will come when you understand that all the sufferings of this present world are not even worth comparing with the life that's going, to get, that's going to come, with the new creation that's gonna come. And one day, when we do see it, it's maybe the pain won't go away, maybe we won't forget it, but we will understand it because we will understand what was born from it. Now please, I, I, wanna hear, I want you to hear me because Christians have, have made several mistakes over the ages, and one of the mistakes has been to glorify suffering um, in that they, they taught people to go out and find as much suffering as you can because that glorifies God, and I don't think that's what Paul's saying. I don't think Paul says to go seek out suffering, but I think he does say, if you are living in Christ, it's gonna come to you. And sometimes it's gonna come as a part of your life, but I'll tell you what, even if it doesn't come as a part of your life, it comes as a part of the world, and you as a child of God, you as an heir of Christ, you as filled with the Holy Spirit, are called in your vocation to wrap the pain of the world in prayer, to cry out with the Spirit 
for those who are suffering, even if it is not you, even if it is not one of your family members, because all of this pain is a part of the groaning of creation for the new world that is being revealed. And part of our vocation as Christians, as spirit-filled children of God, awaiting the adoption of our bodies, is to submit our suffering to God so that our suffering can be somehow mysteriously paired with the suffering of Christ and bring about the world, the world that is coming. The reason this is so important, and this is such an important sermon, is that there are so many churches that in an effort to make people feel better, and I am very sympathetic, I love upbeat sermons. There are so many churches that in an effort to make people feel better will tell you that if you become a Christian, your life will be easier. And that's kind of true, right? God will tend to pull you out of the hole that you're in, the immediate hole that you're in. And God does promise you a future in which all is made well. But in the in-between time, Jesus said, take up your cross and follow me. And there is no Christianity without a cross. And there is no Christianity without followers of Jesus who go through times in this world that nobody wants to go through. And there's no way to read the New Testament and get around that. There's just not. You really have to cherry pick your way through if you're gonna read a completely victorious Christianity that has nothing to do with the cross. The truth of the matter is when you come to Christ, Christ promises you a good future, but not a painless one. Christ promises you that you will be transformed but not necessarily immediately. Christ promises you that all of your suffering will not be in vain, but he does not promise you there will not be suffering. The promise that is given is that one day, the sufferings of this present age will not even compare, will not even compare to what you hold in your hands when the new creation comes. And with that context, I think you're ready to hear the last two chapters, or the last two verses, because the truth of the matter is that is a hard pill to swallow, right? This is why churches don't preach it as often. Come to our church on Sunday mornings, we're going to talk about suffering. Like, there's a reason we don't lead with this, and yet, and yet, what are we to say about these things? If Christ is for us, if God is for us, who is against us? He who did not withhold his own son, but gave him up for all of us. Will he not with him also give us everything else? Who will bring any charge against God's elect? It's God who justifies. Who is to condemn? It's Christ Jesus who died. Yes, who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who intercedes for us, Who will separate us from the love of God? Will hardship or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? You notice in that list, most of us are not ever, even in the worst case scenario in our lives, going to have to deal with most of those, right? Paul is talking to people who are literally going to be executed for their faith. Paul is talking to people who could starve to death because of the next famine, Paul is talking, Paul does not underestimate the sufferings of this present age, and yet he says, what will separate us from the love of God and Christ? Hardship, distress, persecution, famine, nakedness, peril, sword. As it is written, for your sake we're being killed all day long, we're accounted as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither life nor death nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Jesus Christ. It doesn't matter how hard it gets, nothing this world can throw at you is powerful enough to separate you from Christ. Nothing. If you find yourself as on a martyr's cross, it cannot separate you from Christ. 
If you find yourself in front of the tribunals of the world that cannot separate you from Christ, if you find yourself in suffering worse than you can possibly imagine in this age, it cannot separate you from Christ. Nothing, nothing you go through in this world, it's not going to be easy, it's not going to be pleasant, and yet, it will not kill you. Not because it's good for you, but because Christ died and then was raised from the dead, and his resurrection by faith and by grace is your resurrection. And so whatever you go through in this world, as terrible as it may be, and there are some terrible, terrible things that people go through, it will not be effective in separating you from the love of God. You are defined by love. You are molded by love. You are called by love. You are who you are because of love. You will be who you will be because of love. And your whole life will end in glory because of the love of God in Jesus Christ. And that you can paint on a wall. And you can cross stitch on a pillow. And you can look at it. Because when the day comes when you are wondering why you're doing this, you remember Nothing, no power in height or depth or powers or principalities or life or death or anything else in all creation. Nothing will be able to separate you from the love of your God and Jesus Christ our Lord. Would you join with me in a word of prayer? Almighty God, God, we are grateful for the invitation that you have given us to become more than we are. We are grateful for the story that you have told, and we are grateful that you do not leave us alone and you do not let us alone, even when we think we are done, that you keep calling us and you keep inviting us. And we are grateful that you have plans for us that are greater than those we have for ourselves. And so come, Holy Spirit, fill the hearts of your faithful, and kindle in us the fire of your love. Turn our hearts evermore toward you. Comfort us when we are sorrowful and pick us up when we are weary and encourage us when we want to stop and keep our hearts open and reaching toward you and give us a vision of the glory that is coming. This we pray in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, as we, as we say together the prayer our Lord taught, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen.